This is question time at Alhambra Investments. Um, we're going to talk about stock market valuations today. Uh, a few days ago, we got a, um, a comment from one of our clients and uh, wanted to know specifically about Schiller PE. Well, let's kind of broaden that out. And uh, Steve and Joe are here. Uh, Joe, let's start with you. I, I launch into this entire stock market valuation issue. <laughs> Yeah, look, a lot of people are concerned about high valuations. And I think a lot of people, um, I, I, I'll just say that it is not as simple as it seems. Oh, the market's overvalued, I should sell. Well, that doesn't really work that way. Uh, things that are overvalued can continue to be overvalued for a long time. In fact, they can get more overvalued. We've seen that before. Uh, there are a lot of things that drive this stuff, primarily emotion, but also interest rates and some other you know real world things. Uh, but the bottom line is, let's take a look at Schiller P.E. I'm just going to do a little bit here. Um, Schiller P.E. currently is about 38, which is the only time it's ever been higher was 2000. Uh, the dot-com bubble, I think it got it got over 40 at one point. That wasn't there very long. Uh, but we're at 38. And so a 38 uh, eight P.E., what is, first of all, what is Schiller P.E.? Schiller P.E. Is, uh, is, it looks at the trailing 10 years of earnings. Uh, and it is adjusted for inflation, and it compares that to the price of the S&P 500 adjusted for inflation. That's all it is. Price to earnings ratio is nothing more than the price versus the earnings. In this case, it's the real price versus real earnings. And it's the, the real earnings part is a 10-year number. Uh, 10 years, a 10-year average, I guess is a better way to put it. So uh, it does what that's intended to do. And the reason it's called the CAPE, CAPE stands for cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio. By using 10 years, you're supposed to be able to take out the cyclical part of earnings because earnings do rise and fall as you go through a business cycle. So that's what it is. It is expensive. It is very expensive, but it's not necessarily what you think it is. Uh, there's also a concept that he's come up with called Schiller, or, or excuse me, called the excess Cape yield. Excess Cape yield is kind of like the Fed model. And what it does is it takes the inverse of the, the, the CAPE, the, the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio, and get to get an earnings yield. And then it compares that to the real 10-year uh, rate. And what that's supposed to do is tell you what the expected return is over the next 10 years. And if you we've got some slides we're going to be showing you, and this is, you'll see that right now, current expectations are extremely low. Now, he uses uh, the nominal 10-year minus the CPI, uh, it gets a little bit different number than I do, uh, but the bottom line is that 10-year expectations right now for, for returns on the S&P 500 are about 0.5% a year if you use the 10-year tip yield. If you use his, you get a little bit higher number. I think it's about 1.2. Uh, but the bottom line is that expected returns over the next 10 years are very, very low if uh, earnings continue to grow at their historic rate, and that's key point right there. Listen, no valuation method is is exist in a vacuum. All valuation methods have, uh, you have to consider earnings growth and you have to consider interest rates. Both of those things have a big impact on whether the valuation, whether something is overvalued or undervalued. You have something in trading at a PE of 20, but it's got a growth rate of, of earnings of 25%. It may not be overvalued at all. In fact, it probably is undervalued. Assuming that 25% is sustainable, but that's the whole point about this. None of these things are really good. They're not good timing tools. They're not even really all that good as investment tools. Um, you have to think about how things are. Now, I do I do want to point out some other things. Though. We we look at a lot of different things, uh, different ways of valuing things. And I think that's the key here is to, is to use different methodologies and see what you come up with. If you use our methodology, which is we compare the, the earnings yield of the S&P 500 uh, and we use forward earnings, not a great method because, or not a great number necessarily because forward earnings are always very iffy. But you use forward earnings and you get an earnings yield and you compare it to the, we compare it to the triple B bond yield. We do that because the average credit rating of the S&P 500 is the triple B. So if we look at those, we find right now that the market's roughly 20% overvalued. It's, it's actually come down some because interest rates have gone up, uh, whereas stocks have not, uh, have not fallen on that. So uh, the overvaluation is roughly 20%. It's not, uh, that's a snapshot, just so you know. It's not like it's something that looks forward, but we do also look at forward earnings and what estimates are about future earnings. And that gives you an idea when you're starting to price things. Remember, stocks are not short duration assets. These are long duration assets. 
what we do is look out five years and actually five years is probably not enough, but we look out five years to see what the earnings growth is. We look at historic earnings growth rate and we also look at what's expected uh, by the analyst on Wall Street. So if you look at, for instance, the long-term expectations for earnings, or excuse me, long-term historical uh, earnings growth rate for the S&P 500 is about 6.6%. If you think about it, it makes sense. Uh, the S&P 500 earnings, which is a representative of the economy to some degree, can't grow faster than the nominal economy. And so if nominal GDP grows at six, then you should expect earnings to grow at six. And that's about what you get. Anyway, the point is we look at a lot of different things when we do this. We look at earnings expectations. We look at, if you look at, for instance, if you look at next year's earnings on the S&P 500, the expectation right now is that earnings are going to grow by 16%. And they're going to continue to grow uh, at, a, at a rate probably in double digits over the next five years. That's what's expected. We don't know that's really going to happen. Uh, so we look at all these things and we also, uh, I also use an, a method called the Occam's razor method. <laughs> Occam's razor, as you know, is the simplest explanation is probably the right one. And this was a methodology that was favored by John Bogle. And what you do in that case is you take the starting dividend yield, you add annual earnings growth or your expectations thereof. And then you look at the annual change in the price to earnings ratio. And that gives you an expected return. And uh, it's been very accurate over the years. It's not perfect, but it's pretty accurate. And right now, if you look at that, you know, it depends on what, what assumptions you make. If you get a reversion to the mean, if, if the PE goes back to its long-term average, then your projected return over the next 10 years is 4.75%. If the PE stays the same, though, the return's eight. It's not bad at all. Uh, if you look at 10% earnings growth and it reverts to the mean, you get eight. If you get 10% earnings growth and the price to earnings ratio stays the same, you get over 11. But if you get historical earnings growth and the PE falls to 15, uh, yeah, your annual return then is about two. If you repeat 2000 to 2009, where you had, uh, you had uh, it was an inflationary period, really, where the dollar was falling, your expected return is minus one. And if you repeat the 1970s, <laughs> which we've talked about a little bit, right? Is that possible? We think it's possible. We don't really know that for sure, but it's possible. Yeah, your annual return is going to be minus nine. <laughs> so we got to really hope that we don't repeat the 70s because that was an ugly period. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting when you look at the 70s and 80s, you actually had, and this it goes to the importance of interest rates. In the 1970s, you actually had greater earnings growth in the 70s than you did in the 80s. But in the 80s, and in, in, in the 70s, stocks performed extremely poorly. And in the 80s, they performed great. Why? Well, because in the 70s, interest rates were going up. And in the 80s, rates were going down. Uh, so all these things matter. Earnings growth rate matters. Interest rates matter. All these things matter. My conclusion right now is that stocks are modestly overvalued if you're looking at the S&P 500. But I will tell you, if you're looking at other things, even if you just look at something Something as simple as the equal weight index. The equal weight index right now, uh, I'm going to get you some numbers here. Equal weight index. Well, no, I actually just have a chart, so I don't have great numbers. But the S&P uh, 500 equal weight index trades for about 16 times earnings versus 21 times earnings on a forward basis uh, for the S&P 500 itself. Why? Well, because the things that are highly valued are the, are the, uh, are the, uh, the technology stocks. They don't represent most of the index. So look, there's always ways to invest where you don't have to buy overvalued stuff. And you don't. It doesn't mean it's necessarily going to save you if the market goes down. If the S&P 500 goes down, most things are going to go down. But things that are lower at a lower valuation are probably going to go down less. And that's what it means. When, you know, we, we always look at the downside. We try to be defensive in what we do, trying to prevent big drawdowns. That's one of the ways that we do it. So, Steve, with some things just expensive and some things overpriced, how do you meet the challenge of wading through all that? Yeah, well, um, you know, Joe kind of stole a lot of my thunder, but I'm not going to let that stop me from talking. Um, you know, and you kind of get out of this, it's kind of complicated, right? So uh, I'm going to try to um, focus on some of the simpler aspects of this. Um, is the market overvalued? Um, it sure looks that way, right? And we talked a little bit about the Schiller P, but you can also look at uh, the Buffett indicator market cap to GDP. You can look at the Q ratio, the replacement um, value of the market. 
Um, you can you, you you can look at different methodologies. They're going to give you different answers in terms of how much is it overvalued. But what you find is that pretty much all of these are lining up and saying the market is overvalued. And then you kind of get to, OK, why does this matter? As Joe mentioned, it's not a timing tool. It doesn't tell you what the market's going to do next year or the year after. Um, but a lot of these methodologies have a pretty good correlation when you start stretching things out over 10 years. OK, so it matters more for long term. Why does that matter? Well, I would say in general, when you're investing in stocks, you're going to do well long term, maybe not over the next year or two. But in general, there's very few periods where you've lost a decade, very few periods where you actually lost money over a decade. I mean, that happened after 29. It happened after 2000. On an inflation adjusted basis, Joe's absolutely right. That that market was horrible. You have to adjust it for inflation. But, but, but other than that, uh, stocks are pretty much almost a sure thing. So do you have a reason right now of having a lost decade on the S&P 500? Yeah. Yeah, 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 you do. It's, it's one of those few times where you could, where the valuations look like they're flashing some concern about that. But then you get to the wrinkle Joe brought up of, well, the, the cap-weighted S&P 500 is not actually all the stocks. <laughs> it, it's actually concentrated in just a few stocks. And so then you get to the item of, hey, you can actually avoid this valuation issue by investing largely kind of avoiding where some of the concentration risk is some of the most extreme valuations are so you know the, i think it, it i think there's a good argument here there's something to be worried about um i, I think on historical terms we're, we're at extremes i think you're kind of on a cap weighted basis of the s p you're kind of hoping for a best case scenario and hope's not a great strategy Uh, I think a better strategy is is what we've been doing is there's plenty of places that have reasonable valuations you can buy. And, and that's my attempt to simplify all this. Well, Joe, wrap it up with an answer to this question. Given all the things we've talked about, what does the average investor need to do in today's environment? What recommendations, uh, uh, suggestions do you have for them? Gracious, Bob, we're not handing out investment advice here on this little That's podcast. why. That's why I changed my wording. Just put that, you know, right out front there. Uh, what should you do? Well, I gosh, um, I think that you do need to select your your investments very carefully. Um, I think you need to be skeptical of all versions of uh, evaluation methodology. By the way. Uh, and I'll, just, I, I'll give you an example of something I thought of today, actually. One of the reasons Schiller PE is so high is because they use inflation-adjusted numbers, okay? So the it, it, earnings, which are a nominal number, uh, obviously they move with the nominal economy, they've adjusted them, and the Schiller PE, they've been adjusted for inflation. But how have they been adjusted? They've been adjusted with the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, and yet, uh, consumer stocks only represent a, a, a minority of the S&P 500. And in fact, the most overvalued part of the market is technology, where we've actually seen a lot of deflation over the last 10, 15, 20 years, maybe even longer than that. Technology is deflationary. That's exactly what it should be. Um, innovation should be deflationary. And so I question whether we should be deflating earnings in the S&P 500 by the CPI, when that's probably not an index that's reflective of the inflation that has been uh, that, that actually occurs in most of the uh, 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 or a big chunk of the index. Anyway, just just one thought: be skeptical about all these things. People are going to try to scare you and say, "Oh my God, look at the Schiller PE! It is just outrageous and absolutely means the market's going to crash." You got to ignore that stuff. Nobody has a crystal ball, not even Robert Schiller. Thanks for watching, and we appreciate your questions. Keep them coming, and put them in the comment section down below.